Well, God bless everybody. We uh, survived July 4th. Uh, that's always good. And we made it to July 6th. And we're going to look at having a living and real hope. Having, having a living and real hope. And we're going to open with a poem by Edgar Guest called Sermons We See. You know, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather want you to walk with me than merely tell the way. The eye is a better pupil and more willing than the ear. Buying counsel is confusing, but examples always clear. And the best of all the preachers are the men who live their creeds. For to see good in action is what everybody needs. I soon can learn how to do it. If you'll let me see it done, I can watch your hands in action, but your tongue too fast may run. And the lecture you deliver may be very wise and true, but I'd rather get my lessons by observing what you do. For I might misunderstand you and the high advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. You know, C.S. Lewis made a great statement. He said, if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did, the, who did most for the present world were precisely those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. You know, to know God and to love his son, Jesus Christ, is to joyfully anticipate Christ's return. At the exact center of our hope is Christ. He is the heart of hope. Colossians 1.27 says it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Your life is not a series of accidents and coincidences. Your life will influence others. What you do and how you do it will impact others, good and bad. The legacy you leave, your imprint on others, what you did for God in love will determine what your life on earth meant. Our lives should honor God, bring glory to God. Success is measured by life's change, not an accumulation of material goods. He called us to be faithful, not successful by the world's standards. Ezra 7.10. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. He sought the law. So he could do it, and then he could teach others. God judges us by the state of our heart and our desire to serve him. And God's scorecard is different than man's. It is our hearts where the real issues of life exist that exposes the real you. God knows this, and he's looking for individuals who have their hearts prepared to fulfill all his word. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, the New International Version we read, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his, or his height, for I've rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. For Samuel 13, 14, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. So that was the prophet Samuel talking to Saul about David. Next, 13.22, And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king. To him also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. See, David was focused on doing what he thought God would have him to do. He didn't live his life perfectly. Who does? But he kept his heart genuine in proper perspective towards God. Matthew 16, 26, the New International Version, we read, What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? You know, you can have everything the world has to offer, but if your relationship with God is not right, you will live a very shallow existence. God's word should be our motivation in life to do what is right. The rewards it promises contributes to our incentive, our drive, which helps us to carry out our specific function or responsibility in the body of Christ. All motivation is dependent upon words. God gave us his word to keep us motivated. 
We motivate people by what we say, the, by the words we share. And all motivation is resident within words. Matthew 4, 4, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by you know, bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. See, a life spent rooted solely in worldly values and riches is completely me meaningless. It's like chasing the wind. Solomon, a man of power, intelligence, talents, pleasures, and riches, experienced all aspects of life. And his conclusion was that without God, all is worthless. Everything is completely meaningless. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 2 and 14 from the New Living Translation, we read, Everything is meaningless, says the teacher. It's just completely meaningless. I observed everything going on under the sun, and really, eh, it's all meaningless, just like chasing the wind. And then chapter 2, 22 and 23 from the New Living Translation. So what do people get in this life for all their hard work and anxiety? Their days of labor, their days of labor are filled Uh, the, day, uh, uh, let me start this again. Uh, Ecclesiastes 2.22. So what do people get in this life for all their work and anxiety? Their days of labor are filled with pain and grief. Even at night, their minds cannot rest. It's all meaningless. This is life without God. Completely meaningless. However, for those who have a relationship with their Heavenly Father, living this life for Him means something in the next life. Ecclesiastes 12, 1 and 2. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. And look at 13 and 14 from the New Living Translation. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. See, God is the only answer to living a fulfilling life. All other reasons are meaningless. All other reasons are meaningless. Solomon became very successful in the material realm, but unfortunately he allowed his worldly life to drive him away from what matters most, his relationship with the true God. Don't take God and God's love for granted. Keep your priorities in order. We may have missed many memories and moments because of poorly ordered priorities, but it's never too late to set things straight and begin to enjoy God's richest blessings that are all around us. So what is of value to God that merits eternal rewards? It's not meaningless. Well, we start with 1 Thessalonians 2, 4. But as we are allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which tries our hearts. You are allowed to be entrusted with the gospel. Speak about it. 2 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who's going to judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. There's something that's not meaningless. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. All of these actions are in the imperative case, making them commands from God. Thus we should preach his word. Then we should reprove, rebuke, and exhort in love and with patience. When giving reproof, display an attitude of humility of love. This may de determine how it's received. Don't be judgmental. Be kind. Be caring. Be endeavoring to help the individual to understand so they can change to God's way of doing things. We go to Hebrews 12, 5 through 11 from the, in the New International Version. And you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes or chastises or corrects or trains or educates everyone that he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons, for what son is not disciplined by his father? 
if you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children. You're not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. And no discipline seems pleasant at the time, rather painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. The apostles, they were used to doctrine, reproof, and correction. While in turning with Christ, his final words were instructions on how to continue to live for him without him. Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. The last thing he said to them was that they would receive power in order to be witnesses on his behalf. This power from the Holy Spirit would enable them to be witnesses about Jesus to everyone all over the globe, not just in Judea. Now look at verse 9 as it continues. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received them out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, You men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. The very first thing needed for the apostles to know and believe to carry out Jesus' final instructions was that he was coming back. He said, bye, you're going to get power. I'm out of here. He's gone. And immediately the angels show up and go, stop looking. Stop looking. You're going to need the Holy Spirit. He's coming back. He's coming back. That will keep you going. The Holy Spirit will help give you the energy to move forward. Since then, his return has been anticipated throughout every century. God doesn't want us uneducated, unknowledgeable about our hope, about the return of Christ. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. <clears throat> then, we, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And they are comforting. Now, either this is true or it isn't. If it is true, then we should live our life in light of his return and the rewards that we will receive. We should stop playing games with God hypocritically, confessing our devotion to him, but acting in contradiction to his word. Did Christ really rise from the dead? If he did. Is he really coming back? Well, the Apostle Paul debated this issue, and he provided some insight into this question. We go to 1 Corinthians 15, pick it up in verse 12, 12 through 19. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. Your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If, he, if so, be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ is not raised, your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. Then they also which have fallen asleep in Christ, they've all perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable, most pitied. You know, if our entire life is based upon having our hope in Christ, 
that he would return, that he is our Lord and Savior. And this is not true. We are to be most pitied because we have been totally wasting our lives. We should have just lived our life for ourselves instead of wasting time by, you know, helping others. Verse 20 continues. But now is Christ risen from the dead, and he has become the first fruits of them that slept. For since man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his order, his own order. Christ the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. When will those who belong to Christ be made alive? When he returns, and not until then. He is coming back, and no one except God knows when. Thus we live each day, like today, like today's the day. We should choose each day to live like his return really is imminent. Living with that thought in mind might greatly affect how you spend each day. Would you spend any day different if you knew it was your last day on earth? Well, how do you know it's not? 1 Thessalonians 5, pick it up in verse 1, uh, chapter 5, verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brother, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep, as do others. Instead, let us watch. And be sober. Let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day, we need to stay sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, He has not appointed us to go through the great tribulation, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as you also ye do. Keep that comfort and encouragement coming. Everybody needs it. The knowledge of the hope should bring comfort and edification. Philippians 3.20. Philippians 3.20 and 21 from the Working Translation. You know, on the other hand, our citizenship is in heaven. And from where, uh, from where we also patiently wait for the Savior of the Lord, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will trans, who will transform our humiliated body, that it may have the same form as His glorious body, according to the energizing by which He is able to subordinate all things to Himself. God will change these humiliated, vile, corrupt, hurting body into a new spiritual body, like Christ, that will be unlimited in scope and activity. Keeping the hope of Christ's return in the forefront of our minds will enable us in our day-by-day -day living to do whatever he calls on us to do. Thus, it is worth the patient wait for this new spiritual body. 1 John 3, 2 and 3 from the Working Translation. Beloved, we are children of God now. Now, though it has not been revealed what we shall be, we know that when he, Jesus Christ, is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Anyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure or unmixed. See, purity is to be clean and free from anything that would change or corrupts one nature. We need to stay free from any mixture, stain, color, odor or any other useless thing that may infect our love nature. If we maintain our hope as living and real, we will stay pure, having no foreign substance mixed in with godliness, with living our life to his glory. In reality, when we keep the hope in the forefront of our minds, it will help us to overcome temptations. Many times we will be offered a choice to veer away from God's path, to do something contrary to his word for the sake of temporal pleasure. When this happens, having the hope of eternal rewards firmly seated in our mind that Christ may return while we are engaged in an ungodly act will give us the strength to resist the temptation. 
No one wants to be in shame, be, to be ashamed at the time of his coming or to be found spiritually asleep when he returns. 1 John 2, 28. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall abide, we may have confidence and not be ashamed or not be embarrassed before him at his coming. Well, hang on, Christ, come back in 10 minutes. I got to, you know, stop what I'm doing. We must learn to refrain from partaking in immediate sinful gratification, you know, because the reward for resisting temptations far outweighs the loss of any immediate worldly sinful pleasure. Romans 8, 23, working translation to verse 25. Not only does it, but even we ourselves who have the first fruit, which is the spirit, we groan within ourselves, waiting for the inheritance of sonship, that is the redemption of the one body. In fact, we were saved or delivered unto hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. Why would anyone hope for that which is seen? On the other hand, if we hope for that which we do not see, then we wait for it with patience. Since we are convinced he is coming back, what are some of the benefits to living for him today? Why is it worth waiting patiently for? Well, for starters, we have an inheritance coming. Romans 8, 16 through 18, working translation. The spirit itself bears witness with our own spirit that we are the children of God. And since we are children, then we are heirs also. First of all, heirs of God, and secondly, joint heirs with Christ. So that if we do suffer together, we shall also be glorified together as heirs. Therefore, I take into account that the sufferings of the present time are not comparable with the glory that is to be revealed to us. See, being glorified together as an heir of God and a joiner with Christ is worth dealing with some light affliction in this life. There is no comparison today to the rewards that will follow us throughout eternity. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, working translation. Thus, our momentary light weight of the affliction produces for us an eternal exceedingly heavy weight of glory while we focus not on the things that are seen but we focus on the things that are not seen in fact the things that are seen are temporary but the things that are not seen are eternal our focus must be on the hope what is not seen the future benefits like many old testament believers who lived for god did as they looked forward to their hope which was the first coming of christ John 8, 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and he was glad. Abraham obeyed God and lived for him, knowing that a Messiah, a Savior, the promised seed would come to deliver him and eventually provide him entrance into God's perfect new city. This provided gladness, joy, and pleasure for him. Hebrews eleven six, 6, working translation, then 8 through 10. Now, without believing, it is impossible to please God, for he who approaches God must believe that God exists and that he becomes a rewarder to those who seek him. By believing Abraham, when he was called to go out uh, into a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, he obeyed. He went out, not knowing where he was going. Google Maps wasn't invented yet. By believing, he sojourned as a stranger in the land of promise dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, joint heirs of the same promise. For he was waiting for the city, having foundations, whose craftsman and designer builder is God. No flaws in that city. Abraham waited for a city. He never received it. It was always future. But he believed in it. He had a hope. That is why he lived his life in obedience to God. It's the hope of Christ's return that keeps you living for God. Without the hope, you get tired of the struggles, the strife, the fight, and all the stupidity that you have to deal with in this life. When you understand the hope, you will just keep moving with enthusiasm with all the love of God you have in your heart, knowing that you have the more abundant life now and his glory throughout all eternity. Hebrews 11:24, working translation dealing with Moses now. By believing Moses, having become great, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. When he became an adult, 
Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh's daughter had raised him. He had the finest education money could buy. He had the prestige, the dignity of the court of Egypt. Yet he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Well, why? Because like Abraham, he looked down the road and he saw the hope. He saw a city that had foundations that would last throughout all eternity. And in his heart, he knew Egypt would not. Verse 25 now, working translation. Choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to have a temporary enjoyment of sin. He considered the insult suffered for the coming Christ to be greater riches than the treasures of Egypt because he looked to the reward. By believing, he left Egypt, not fearing the rage of the king. In fact, he persevered as though he saw him who is invisible. That's a great line. He persevered as though he saw him who is invisible. Others did so also. They did so to gain eternal life with eternal rewards, to gain the better resurrection. Verses 34 and 35, continuing from the working translation. Quenched the uh, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were empowered from weakness, became strong in battle, turned back the armies of the enemies. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, not accepting the redemption. Why? So that they might obtain a better resurrection, the resurrection of the just. They endured. John 5, 28 and 29. Marvel not at this, because you know the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the graves, not floating around in heaven, all of those that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and they're going to come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. How about Acts 24, 15? And have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Luke 14, 12 through 14. Then said he also to him that bade him, Without make, make a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends or thy brother, or thy kinsmen, or thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense is made thee. But when thou have what makes a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. The final paycheck will come from God at the time of the judgment, judgments, which is why Abraham and Moses chose to live a particular lifestyle that was pleasing to God. David knew and believed that he was going to be raised from the dead. He was going to be made alive again. Look at Psalm 16, 8. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved or I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart's glad, my glory rejoiced, my flesh also, also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. God will not leave me in hell, shield the grave. David knew that God would not leave, forget, or forsake him in the grave for all eternity. Thus his heart was glad, and he had rest and full and fullness of joy, despite persecution. Look at Job 19.25. Look what Job has to say here. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Job knew. He did not question. He had no doubt that his Redeemer would come. Job lived a long time ago, but he knew about, the, about this hope, about his hope, that there was a day coming when his Redeemer would stand upon the earth. Now look at verse 26, Job says, And although my skin warms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Job said that although this body would become frail and deteriorate, he knew that when he was resurrected, he would see God with a new entity, a new body. Now, flesh is put as a figure of speech to emphasize there would be a body of some kind. 
It's that hope that makes it possible for us to love God and to do the work of the ministry, to love people, to stand for God's word day after day, declaring what it says, because his word never fails. It never fails to accomplish the purpose that God sent it for. It is impossible for anyone who rightly divides the word of truth to even begin to imagine that the church of God will go through the time frame called the Great Tribulation, also called the Wrath of God or the Lord's Day. Information pertaining to it can be found in the Old Testament books of Daniel and Ezekiel, also the Gospels in the book of Revelation. Romans 8.1, Working Translation. So there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. um, Condemnation is the Greek word katakrima, which means judgment. The sentence pronounced against someone. There is no judgment to them that are in Christ Jesus because they've already been judged and fully paid for by their substitute, the Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a done deal. 1 Thessalonians 1.10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. We have been saved from the wrath to come. That's pretty clear. Romans 5.1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Since we have been justified, we can have real peace. We had to go through the great tribulation. There's no way you could be peaceful today. Romans 5, 9, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Verse 10, for if we, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of a son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Your pardon. How could you have joy in God if you knew that tomorrow you might get hurt, destroyed, incarcerated, or totally crushed? Where would be the joy? Believers in the body of Christ, the church of God, may have tribulation now in this life, but we will not have the great tribulation. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yea, and all who or that, all who or that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Individual believers may have tribulation in this life due to persecution, but that is not the great tribulation. It's not the period of the Lord's day or the wrath of God. The church of the body will be at rest before that great and notable day of the Lord comes to pass. First, uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 4 through 6, working translation. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you among the churches of God regarding your patience and believing in all your persecutions and afflictions that you endure. It is evidence of the just judgment of God for you to be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer, since it is just with God to repay affliction to those that afflict you. It's just with God. He's the one who will repay affliction to those who afflict us. There's a time coming where God is going to repay the affliction that we may be receiving now. That's why we don't have time to waste on vengeance. We are to focus our time and energy to witness his word, in season, out of season, to stand for God. God will take care of our light work. Verse seven now, it continues, working translation. And you who are afflicted along with us to repay rest at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven and his messengers of power. With flaming fire, he will give vengeance against those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel regarding our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be sentenced to eternal destruction from the face of the Lord and from the glory of his prevailing ability after he comes to be glorified in his holy ones and to be admired in that day by all those who have believed for our witness to you was believed. See, as you study the subject, you realize that Christ actually comes back twice. The first time, those in Christ will meet him in the air, as we read in 1 Thessalonians 4. Then he comes back with his messengers of power to the earth for the judgments of the just and the unjust. Without this actual knowledge of our hope, without this actual knowledge of our hope, many born-again ones have been walking in defeat, full of fear, frustrated, 
expecting God's vengeance to come upon them at any moment. We as God's children are more than conquerors. We've passed from death unto life. We shall never more come into condemnation. The day of wrath will never touch us. We can enjoy this life and proudly proclaim the truths about the Lord Jesus Christ's accomplishments. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1 through 4, working translation. Now, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together up to him, brothers, we ask you that you not be hastily shaken in mind or disturbed, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by an epistle, as if it were from us, as saying that the day of the Lord is present. Do not let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not be present unless there first comes the departure. And that man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who sets himself in opposition to and exalts himself against anything that is called God or object of devotion, to the extent that he sits in the sanctuary of God, displaying himself that he is God. The departure. The gathering together must happen first before the great tribulation takes place. All right, let's consider a man who lived the whole perfected in his life. That's the Apostle Paul. Go to 2 Corinthians 11. Look at a couple of minor instances that happened in his life. Yeah, right, minor. 2 Corinthians 11, 23. <laughs> Are they all ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prison more frequent. In death saw, of the Jews, five times received thy forty stripes, save one. Th th thrice was I beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the heat by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brothers, in weariness and painfulness in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside these things that are without, that which comes unto me daily, the care of all the churches. What kept Paul going? You have to have something really worthwhile, something you are totally committed to, something you really believe in in order to go through this. If you don't have something worth dying for, in your life, then you really don't have anything worth living for either. This is the hope perfected. Well, I'm going to capitalize it through here. The hope perfected. Look how Paul lived. He did all that he could, and he just stood, no matter what the adversary did, no matter what he had to go through. He did not complain. He just stood, and he continued holding forth the same truth that got him into trouble, which was preaching and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ and the great mystery. God stood beside him when he stood on his word. And Paul never quit, never gave up, never sold out, never denied his Lord, never complained about God forsaking him. He asked God for help in what he was going through. And God told him, my grace is sufficient for you. God did, however, give Paul a glimpse into what the future was going to be like. 2 Corinthians 12, 2. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell, but God knows. Such is one that was caught up or caught away to the third heaven. You know, in the Bible, there are three heavens and earth. The first is recorded in the first three chapters of Genesis. The second is now, with the third one recorded in the book of Revelation after Jesus Christ comes back the second time. There'll be a new earth where it dwells only righteousness. Paul was caught away meaning God gave him revelation, a vision about that third heaven. That is what kept him going through the persecutions. God gave him revelation concerning the future. He showed him the new Jerusalem, which is recorded in the book of Revelation. Verse 4, how that he was caught away into paradise, and he heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful or permitted for man to utter. See, Paul believed in the hope of Christ's return. He was going through persecution, tribulation, affliction, but it wasn't the great tribulation. Since he was faithful and standing, God caught him away. God gave him a vision about the new Jerusalem, which kept him going, kept him excited. He was not allowed to write about it. The apostle John did later. He wrote about it in the book of Revelation. 
Romans 12, 11 and 12. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Paul, the same man of God who was going through much tribulation, wrote about rejoicing in hope. He wrote about being patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. And he was an expert on the subject. Look at Philippians 3, 8 through 10, working translation. I certainly do consider all these things to be a loss for the excelling nature of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For him, I sustain the loss of all things, all those things, and I consider them to be refuge so that I could gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own justness, which is of the law, but which is through believing concerning Christ. The justice from God by the right way of believing. As a result, I know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, having been conformed to his death. Paul knew. He had experienced it. We too need to know who our sufficiency is. Know who protects us. Know who keeps and guides us. Know who makes intercession for us. We need to get to the point where we really know him, not just with head knowledge, but exper experientially. Uh, verse 11 continues, working translation, that somehow I may reach the out-resurrection from the dead. It is not that I've already received or that I've already completely finished, but I press on in pursuit, if perhaps I may win, based on that for which I was also won by Christ. Brothers, I do not consider myself to have won, but this one thing I do do, forgetting the things that are behind and stretching forward towards the things that are ahead. I press on in pursuit toward the goal for the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. This is a great exhortation for us. Forget those things that are behind. Press towards the prize of God's high calling in Christ Jesus. This is the hope perfected in a man who walks daily towards the upward calling, pressing on, forgetting the things that were past, moving on because he saw the prize, the goal, eternal rewards. Well, what about you? Do you want some eternal rewards? 2 Timothy 4, 6 and 7, working translation. As a matter of fact, I am already being poured out. and The time of my departure has arrived. I have contended in the good contest. I have finished the race. I have kept the right way of believing. Throughout all the persecutions, he maintained the truth. He kept the right way of believing because he saw the hope. He saw the return of Christ and the rewards which will accompany him. Verse 8 continues in the working translation. Henceforth, there is reserved for me the crown of justice, which the Lord, the last judge, will repay to me. In that day, and not only to me, but also to all those who have loved his appearing. No question. Do you live for him loving his appearing? This reward is available to all who do. 2 Corinthians 5.10, working translation. Moreover, we must all appear before the judgment, the bema of Christ, so that each one, may receive in return for the things that he did while in the body, whether good or bad. This judgment seat, the bema, is the place from which prizes and rewards are distributed for the loving, believing action done in this life. Salvation is by grace. Rewards are given to men and women who merit them. The church of the body appears before the bema of Christ to receive the crown of justness. Rewards for deeds done for the faithfulness of our stewardship for him. We appear not to receive God's sentences of wrath or condemnation, but instead we appear to have praise of God because we will have already been judged for our iniquity by our substitute, Christ Jesus, who totally paid the price for all the sins of the world. 1 John 2.2, 2, New International Version. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. 
when all people have been resurrected, except the church of the body, because they will be already up and with Christ, everyone else will appear before this judgment seat. The bench, the thronos, which is an entirely different place than the bema. This is the bench from which God's judgment sentences will be pronounced on the rest of mankind. Don't want to find yourself there. Revelation 20, 11 and 12, working translation. And I saw a great, brilliant, white throne, thronos, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And the scrolls were opened, and another scroll was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from what was written in the books regarding their works. All right, let's consider some of the rewards that are available to the believer that are mentioned in the scriptures. Matthew 10, 37 to 42. He that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that takes not his cross and follows after me is not worthy of me. He that finds his life shall lose it. He that loses his life for my sake shall find it. He that receives you receives me. And he that receives me receives him that sent me. He that receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. He that receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water, only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. So be your best for him. Whatever your role in life is, walk in love, caring for God's people. Go to 1 Corinthians 9. You don't have to have a gift of ministry to be rewarded as if you do. Do your part in the body. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, working translation. Do you not know that all of those who run in a race certainly do run? But only one receives the prize. So run. Run in such a manner that you may win. Everyone who competes in a contest exercises self-control in all things. Now they do it to receive a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible prize. Therefore, I run in this manner, not as with uncertainty. I box in this manner, not as punching the air. I beat my body and treat it as a slave, lest by some means, after the heralding to others, I myself should be rejected from the competition." There are prizes waiting for those who exercise self-control in all discipline training, who are great athletes of the spirit. So be careful in how you train. 1 Corinthians 3, 8 through 15, working translation. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his own compensation according to his own hard labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You're God's farm, God's building according to the grace of God that was given to me. I have laid the foundation as a wise master builder, and another builds on it. Let each watch how he builds on it. For no one can lay another foundation besides what is laid, which is Jesus Christ. But anyone builds on this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, then the work of each person will become manifest. For the day will make it clear, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will prove each person's work. What sort it is? If anyone's work that he built on, on it will remain, then he will receive compensation. If anyone's work will be burnt up, then he will sustain a loss, but he himself will be saved or delivered, even as through fire. You will receive your own rewards. A workman is worthy of his hire, his pay, his reward. God will reward you honestly and accurately, for your work for him done in love. 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treads out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. And James 1, 12, from the working translation says, Blessed or happy is the man who patiently endures temptation. For when he has been proved, he will receive the crown of the life that he promised to those who love him. Those who endure temptation shall receive this crown of life, which includes those who rightly divide God's word to stand approved before him and then live it. There is a reward, a crown of glory, 
for leaders and elders in the body of Christ who are proper examples to the believers. First Peter 5, 1 to 4, working translation. As a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of the Christ and a partaker of the glory that is going to be revealed, I exhort the elders among you to shepherd the flock of God among you, overseeing them, not out of obligation, but willingly, not of a variousness, but eagerly, not as being lords over God's lot, but making yourselves models to the flock. Thus, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive in return an unfading crown of glory. Your labor is not in vain, because he is coming back to reward the to reward the faithful. That's the hope. First Corinthians 15, 58, further encouragement. Therefore, my beloved brother, be ye steadfast. Be unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And from the working translations, Galatians 6, 7 through 10, do not be misled. God is not to be sneered at. In fact, whatever a person sows, that will he also harvest. For he who sows to his own flesh will harvest corruption from the flesh. But he who sows to the Spirit will harvest eternal life from the Spirit. Let us not be discouraged as we do the good, for in due season we shall harvest, provided we do not become exhausted. Therefore, as we have the season, let us work the good toward all, especially those who are of the household of the right way of believing. See, we receive joy on the inside because we believe what the Word of God says. We do not condition our lives by the circumstances around us. Romans 15, 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing, that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. And we go to Ecclesiastes 9 from the English Standard Version, verses 4 through 10. But he who is joined with all the living has hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead, they know nothing. And they have no more reward for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished. And forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. So go, eat your bread with joy, drink your wine with a merry heart. For God has already approved what you do. Let your garments be always white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun, because this, because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do with your might, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you're going. In conclusion, it is going to be great. How great? We can't even comprehend how great. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. So Ecclesiastes 12, 13 let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That is, if you want a fulfilling Christian walk, because he is coming back. Maybe today, maybe tonight. Revelation 22, 20 to close. He which testifies these things says, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord. Jesus. So thank you, God, for your word, for giving us a hope we can understand, for us being able to care for you and care about you and to love you and for what you do for us. We are so thankful to know that your son's coming back. We will be rewarded, and it's worth standing in this day and time and hour, despite the craziness and the evil in the world. We can stand above it, looking towards, looking forward to your son's return and how much you take care of us and want only the best for us in this life through the power that has been attained for us by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.